Praise the Lord. Wanasikiwe. So it's another day that we are gathered in the presence of the Lord. And today we will share on a subject called Understanding the Heart of Man. We are in a time whereby, I don't know if it's happened to you, but for me, I watch the news, I get into social media, and I get so angry. Yeah? As a believer, we are told to guard our hearts, but I get so angry. I watch the news and I'm so disappointed. And I know this is something that is men. Yeah? It's human to feel such kind of emotions. And today, uh, we just want to share on what it actually looks like or understanding the heart of man. So, uh, while thinking on this subject, I, I asked, what is the heart now? Because we want to look at what does the heart constitute of. And, you know, there is a biological or scientific way of looking at the heart, which is to define the heart as a muscular organ behind the breastbone, yeah? So, looking at the heart, uh, a normal adult heart is about the size of a fist. So, uh, that is medically for uh, at least Pastor Palm, who is endowed with such kind of knowledge. Even for us who've been through biological classes, we know that it is a normal adult heart is about the size of a human or, or the size of a fist. So looking at the function of the heart from that biological way is that it functions to pump blood through the blood vessels of the cardiovascular system. So when you look at it biologically, the heart functions to pump blood to the organs of the body in a process of the cardiovascular system. But also, at the time when we were looking on the subject about love, and with this love, it's a common thing for they who love each other to say that you've given your heart to another person, that you've given your heart. So you see, there I was looking at it from, uh, biologically or medically, is it viable? Is it really viable to give someone your heart and allow them to do this, the function that is to pump blood. So even looking at it from that perspective, there is already a gap. Because when you look at it from the carnal system, where you can give your heart to another, then I looked at it also on this scripture. What does the heart look like? And so looking at it from the scriptures, you'd realize that the term heart, the term heart, mind and soul, are uh, more often than not used interchangeably. So many a times you'd find heart, mind, and soul used almost in the same context, and at times they might imply the same thing. An example is that in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 27, the Bible says that, and ye shall love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and all of your mind. So you can see the function of the heart being mentioned. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So looking at it even from that perspective, we can see that when we're looking at it from the scriptures, the term heart is normally used interchangeably with the terms called mind and soul. So our heart, therefore, is our mind, it is our intellect, it is our conscience, it is our emotions. When you look about man constituted of the spirit, the soul, and the body, so within the facet of the soul, we have the heart, where the heart is now our mind, is our intellect, is our conscience and also revolves around emotions. The heart is uh, the center of our feelings, reasoning, and thoughts. Our hearts are who we are at the very core. So when we 
need to understand the heart or looking at what the heart is, it's no longer we're looking at it from just an organ of the body, but it is who we are at the very core. Our identity is rooted in who we are. So uh, let's go to features of the heart because we want to understand further what is this heart that we are talking about. So one of the features, number one, is that the heart is the basis of divine approval. The heart is the basis of divine approval. First Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. The heart being the basis of divine approval. Or the back story of this uh, portion of scripture, First Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, is that the Lord God had rejected King Samuel. King Saul, sorry. And so he had instructed the prophet Samuel to go into the house of David, that he would anoint a man that he will show him. So in this context, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So in order for the Lord to qualify an individual, a man, for a given position, he looks at the posture of our hearts. But you can see within this scripture, it says that because I have refused him, I have refused him. When the Lord speaks about he has refused you, owing to the posture, the position of your heart, Refusal is different from being rejected. We have to get that difference. Because remember, for King Saul, the Lord said that he has rejected King Saul. But when it came to Eliab, whom the prophet thought that this was the man who had every feature that could look as the likely king, the Lord says that he has refused him. When he speaks about the Lord refusing an individual, it implies that, one, you are not the chosen one. When you are refused, you are not the chosen one. The Lord was looking for the king. He needed that through the prophet, he would anoint the king of Israel. But you can see that Eliab was not the chosen one. So because he was not the chosen one, the Lord refused him. Other times why we might be refused is when we are not ready for that mandate that is expected of us. Look at it from a child. As a parent, there are things that you won't uh, really give to your child or, or really like if a child, for example, this young age has got a knife in their hands. They do not know what this knife can actually do. They can harm themselves by that knife. So, this knife can be used by an adult for a better thing, but within the hands of a child, that knife can turn into something catastrophic. So because Eliab was not ready for that position, the reason why we say that he was not ready is that when you look at even when Goliath, was now warring against the nation of Israel. And he was speaking of taunts against the Lord God Almighty. Eliab was one of the people in the army of Israel who feared even to go and uh, to fight for the dignity of the Lord. So you can see that even though he was a mighty man in the eyes of men, but his heart did not really have the faith that was needed for the function of a king at that level. So that is why he was refused. So we can declare that Eliab lacked full faith in Yahweh as he was part of the vast army of Israel who did nothing about the taunt of the Philistine Goliath. So he was refused because one, he was not the chosen one, marking a sensitive to calling. When you are called, the mantle shall know. So even for this particular individual, he was not the chosen one. And by that, the Lord clearly refused him. But when we turn to the same chapter in the 22nd verse, 
Now David has come in the midst. David has already arrived. Remember we are looking at the heart being the function of the basis of divine approval. So in the 22nd verse, actually in the 12th, sorry, 12th verse, it speaks about now David has already come. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. So you see that there was a search for the king of Israel. And the significance of this was that by virtue of the anointing of the oil, it would show that a new king had already come. And now here, when David comes into this place, the Lord says, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. The heart is the basis of divine approval. Uh, David is the same individual who, in the book of Psalm, chapter 51, verse 7, spoke about a broken heart and a contrite spirit. The Lord shall not reject. The Lord shall not forsake. The Lord shall not despise. So this was a man who understood what the Lord required of an individual to arise within that position of authority. So you can see that the heart being the basis of divine approval for Eliab, he could not get into that position because he wasn't the chosen one and his heart position was not in line with what the Lord required of a king. And looking at it even in now looking, uh, when you're trying to compare between refusal and rejection, in 1 Samuel chapter 15 verse 23, the Lord rejects Saul. So here we can see where the Lord actually rejects Saul. He rejected, when it comes to rejection, when the Lord rejects a man, he rejects a man because of the corruption of his heart. So when the heart is corrupted because... The Lord is seeking for they who have a pure heart. And in this time when he's seeking for a king, in this context he says that for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Looking at King Saul at this particular time, his posture of the heart was not in tune with what the Lord required of. One, he rejected the word of the Lord. So if a king can disapprove of the word of the Lord, if a king can reject the word of the Lord, and this was re very focal for every king to master, to know the word of the Lord. But you can see that Saul, having grown in pride, rejected the word of the Lord. And now that he rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord also rejected him because his heart over time grew corrupted. You are rejected because of the corruption of your heart. So that was the heart being the basis of divine approval. Number two, the heart is the basis of divine rewarding system. The heart is the basis of divine rewarding system. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10. So in the first one we're looking at the heart being the basis of divine approval. And here the heart is the basis of divine rewarding system. So in this verse it says that I the Lord search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways according to the fruits of his dreams. So when the Lord searches the heart of a man, depending on what he gets out of the heart of this man, he gives to that man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his dreams. The heart is the basis of divine rewarding system. Where based on the position of your heart, if your heart is clean, if your heart is pure, then the Lord who searches the heart, who tests the mind, shall reward you, shall give you according to his ways, according to the fruit of the dreams of that individual. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. You're still looking at 
the heart being the basis of divine rewarding system. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5. The Bible says that, Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. So uh, the reward is based on what the Lord will get out of the heart of these individuals. These things that are hidden, the hidden things of darkness, this Lord is able to reveal the counsels of the heart. Why? Because we have seen in Jeremiah that it is the Lord who searches, who tests the mind of an individual. And by this, he is able to know clearly what is in the heart of a person. And by this, then an individual is able to attain that praise that will come from God. This praise that comes from God is the reward of a good heart, of a pure heart. In this context, Paul encourages us to quit the work of pronouncing judgment on the quality of another person's service to the Lord. Rather, they should wait for the Lord to come and pronounce the final verdict. So God's verdict is the only one that matters. In this context, God's verdict. Many people may have different ideologies concerning an individual. But here Paul is bringing us to know that God's verdict is the only one that matters and is the only one qualified to evaluate what is inside of a person, the purposes of someone's heart that are hidden in darkness from human eyes. So when the Lord is willing or is going to reward an individual based on the position of his heart, as men, as men more often than not, we might we might uh, see the outward appearance of an individual and, and actually uh, be, uh, be in a position where we might make a decision which is not quite right. But it is the Lord who searches these hidden things of darkness and reveals the counsels of the heart. So here, the Lord using the heart to be a basis of his rewarding system, you can see that the reward that he'll give unto this individual after he has revealed the things that are hidden and revealed the counsels of the heart, the Lord would be fair in giving such kind of a reward. If he decides that, an example that if he decides that he has sought the heart of Brian, for example, and found him to be a trustworthy individual, a man after his own heart and rewards him there the basis of that reward is right because it is the lord who only has that capability of searching the heart of an individual then the third one is the heart can also be the foundation of iniquity so we have seen the heart being the basis of divine approval the heart being the basis of divine rewarding system but the heart can also be the foundation of iniquity. A few weeks ago, uh, actually project Ezekiel chapter 28 from verse 12. Looking at this uh, portion of scripture, we were in a time when we were arguing it out, how an individual who walked in a place that was seemingly perfect be found to have iniquity. It says that son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you are the seal of perfection. This is the description of this individual. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. The next verse. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. So the Lord laid everything that was precious, everything that was of value to him on this particular individual, that he was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was his covering, the sardius, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pikes 
was created for you on the day you were created. The next verse. You are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. That portion of scripture really disturbed me. Because more often than not, we ask for fire in order that we might be purified. But this was an individual who walked back and forth on the midst of the fiery stones. The Bible speaks about him being the anointed cherub. The anointed cherub. These beings who stand before the Lord God Almighty. And he was anointed. He was smeared with the Holy Spirit. So this individual who was smeared with the Holy Spirit, the individual who walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones, the fire that you call for for purification, it was an individual who walked back and forth in the midst of such kind of stones. Next verse. You are perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. An individual who was perfect from the day he was created till iniquity was found in him. We are in church, we do things that are seemingly religious, we worship until iniquity was found in us. Until iniquity was found in this individual. Look at this heart. How can the heart that has been walking around places of purity having iniquity? So the heart also being the foundation of iniquity, we need to understand that the beauty, the giftings and anointing that this individual, the anointed cherub, carried, did not matter when his heart became corrupt. Many a times we, there is this ideology that God desires for our worship. So he's just seated somewhere and he's just waiting for us to worship him, for him to feel good. And you see, when we are so gifted, or when we are gifted in particular aspects, we might feel like God actually needs us. Hmm? Till iniquity was found in this individual. You might be so gifted, but when your heart becomes corrupted, you have no use unto the Lord. He will reject you, even though you are gifted. We are reminded that uh, the, the giftings of the Lord are without repentance. So even if you are so gifted, even though you are beautified, but as long as you allow corruption to get into your heart, and if you allow your heart to become corrupted, the Lord shall utterly reject you. This was an individual who walked along the fiery stones of fire. We are asking for fire in order that us we might be purified. But this was an individual whom that was his abode. But still iniquity was found in him. So no matter the level of gifting you walk in, so long as you allow corruption to get into your heart, you would be as a clanging symbol. The Bible reminds us that the gifts of the Lord are without repentance. But divine approval is subject to the purity of your heart. In order for the Lord to validate you as one that belongs to him, as his own, it needs purity of heart. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it speaks about prophecy that came, came not in all time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So looking at even uh, the prophecy that came by these people, the character, the nature of these people as described by scripture, if you can project 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21, is that they were holy men, men who are in right standing with God. Holiness means to be separated. So these were men who were holy and they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In our walk with God, what is the position of our heart? In our doings, in our daily activities, what is the position of our heart? Do we have the awareness that even in the place of righteousness, in the place of purity seemingly, corruption might be found in such kind of things? And this is why the scriptures would 
uh, encourage us to treat our salvation with fear and trembling. Knowing that there can be corruption that can come. The Bible speaks about guard your heart, guard your heart. From out of it flows the issues of life. So looking at this uh, heart that indeed it can be the basis of divine approval. Indeed it can be the basis of God's rewarding system. That God can bless you because of the purity of your heart. But also because of the corruption of your heart you can be rejected. When you are within where people are just sharing praises, you might be found to be corrupted. And so, uh, the heart now, looking at it from this context, is that if iniquity can come into our hearts, I go to a place where I was asking that now, what will, what will be for us now? If you can actually be walking in the place of purity, but still be found to having iniquity. In, uh, in, uh, I, 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 I ran through Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 7 is the story of Cain and Abel. After having presented their sacrifices unto the Lord God. And the Lord was uh, pleased with the sacrifice of Abel, but... Uh, displeased to the sacrifice of Cain. So here, he says that if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So the door that is implies of is of your heart. It is knocking. Remember when Jesus knocks at the door of your heart? So, the omniscient, the all-powerful God is willing to knock at the door of your heart. That is in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, where Jesus knocks at the door of your heart. So when sin, before it actually comes in, it stays, it knocks the door of your heart. And God was warning this man Cain that if he does not do well, sin lies at the door of his heart. And the desire of this sin is that it will rule over him. It would be able to rule over him. The devil alike does not just come into our hearts. He also knocks. But many a times our focus is on the challenges that we have experienced or the pains that we have suffered. And here is where we are giving the enemy chance to come into our hearts that he might corrupt our hearts. So knowing that even the enemy needs your permission in order for him to come into your heart, guard your heart. You can choose to say that none of anything that is contrary to the nature of God shall get into my heart. You guard your heart. Ananias, in the book of Acts chapter 5 verse 3, Ananias and the wife Sapphira, after having fooled the Holy Spirit, they thought that they would be able to get away this. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And Ananias allowed Satan to come into his heart. Judas Iscariot allowed Satan to come into his heart. And you see the enemy, the funny thing about this enemy, okay, compared to a little opportunity, he gets in completely. And you can see that Judas because of uh, this uh, desire for more, he came to a point of uh, now selling off Jesus Christ. And by this, because of the guilt that was in, in his heart, even killed himself. So we need to know that even the enemy would need our permission. So when the Bible speaks about in Jeremiah 4.23, Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Today you have to pray that, Lord, help me to guard my heart. That anything that does not look like you, anything that does not look like the Lord, shall not gain entry into our hearts. Because some of these things, especially those of the darkness, if they come, they totally corrupt us. They, make, they lead us into various messes. And sometimes we may not have the capacity of coming out of them. Jesus prayed concerning Peter. And he said that Peter, Satan, has requested to sift you 
like wheat. But I have prayed for you. But you can see the contrast with this other man, Judas, who he allowed Satan to dominate his heart. And by this, he sinned. And he died in his sin. So when the Bible reminds us in Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, to guard our hearts, today, we see uh, the parliament, the areas that uh, are known to be precious for the government are guarded. Even ourselves, we guard our monies, we guard our precious jewels, anything that is precious in our eyes, we guard them. But do we guard our hearts? Do we guard our hearts? Seeing that we have put much emphasis on material things, on physical things that will die and not even they're just for this world alone. But the scriptures remind you to guard your heart with diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The heart is the fountain where life springs from. So knowing that the heart is the fountain where life springs for, you have to be really particular about guarding your heart. If it is the fountain where life will be able to come out of, and the Bible encourages you that guard your heart. Today, I want you to make that prayer that, Lord, help me to guard my heart. Our good behaviors and character and attitude may be defined by the wrong things we give entry into our hearts. It might be so good, but when we allow offense into our hearts, anything that is contrary to the nature of God, it corrupts anything good that we might be able to have. So guard your hearts. Guard your hearts. So how do we sustain a pure heart? How do we sustain a pure heart? Number one, allow your heart to be tried. Allow your heart to be tried. This is from Psalm chapter 139, verse 23 to 24. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Allow your heart to be tried. To be tried by who? By the Lord. Because it is the Lord who searches the heart. The man wrote that, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It takes humility in order for you to allow God, to invite God to try your heart. That you might see if there is any wicked thing in you, that he might reveal unto you. So it takes humility for you to even ask the Lord, that Lord, try my heart, search my heart, and if you find any wicked thing that is in me, remove it from me. So be that kind of individual who even prays unto the Lord that, Lord, search my heart. Allow your heart to be tried by the Lord, because having seen that the heart is the basis of divine approval. If you continually walk in a heart that is corrupt and you are adamant, you, you resist any point of correction that can come from anyone, even the Lord himself, then there are levels with God that you're not able to walk in because the heart is the basis of divine approval. So for you to sustain a pure heart, Pray unto the Lord, asking that he will try your heart, that you'll be able to try your heart, that whatever wicked thing that will be or is in your heart, you shall be able to remove it. And this is the blessing, that he will lead you in the way everlasting, having purified you of anything that is contrary to his nature, the Lord is able to lead you in the way everlasting. So allow your heart to be tried. There was a time when we'd be told about the baptism of fire. And we'd be told uh, by Percy that, you know, it is good when you ask the Lord that you send this fire, yeah? rather than him coming by himself. So even in this context, I'd rather you ask God that, Lord, try my heart. I present my heart unto you. 
the heart you have seen it that it can have iniquity even though you are walking in places of purity even though you are in church even though you are actively serving even though you pray for so long even though you cry out to him shedding tears in his presence but iniquity can still be found in such kind of a context so ask the lord that the lord might be able to try your heart that if at all there shall be iniquity will be able to remove it then the second one is interact with the word interact with the word Psalm 119 verse 11. How do you sustain a pure heart? Interact with the word of God. Psalm 119 verse 11. He says that your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the word carrying life. Jesus spoke about that the words that he speak of a spirit and life. So when you interact with this word continually, even your life, your heart is being renewed into the character and to, into the nature of God. So he says that your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This man hid the word of the Lord in his heart because the word would be as, as a sort of a defense towards sin that might come into his heart. So if you want to be in a position where you, you, you walk in purity of heart, you have to interact with this word of God continually on a daily basis. Interact with the word of God. He said that your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So when we look at the topic of the heart of man, it is a topic that is vast. It is one that is vast. In Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the Lord speaks about the heart of man being deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Who can understand it? But we are seeing that there are certain things that when we allow into our hearts, they corrupt us. They corrupt us. So by this, interact with the word of God. Hide the word of God in your heart that you might be able to walk in purity of heart. So, as I come to a conclusion, today, uh, there are many things that are happening. I started by telling you that I watch the news, I go through social media and I get angry. My heart breaks every time. But we've been called to be a light unto this world. And in this time, when people are asking of that, what is the stance of the church? The question is now, who is this church? Do we need a specific body to speak for us to know that the church has spoken? Or does your view really matter as the church of the Lord? So, by that, even myself, I have come to a place of knowing that even though we deeply love the Lord and we love Him dearly, but there are things that hurt us. So today, God has brought us an emphasis that our hearts have to be tried again. That in such a time when as a country we are facing times of trials, but we, our hearts have to be tried again. We are that generation that would ultimately rise to speak of. There was a time when adversity came into our nation. But because there were men and women who could be able to pray, who could be able to hold this nation in prayer, our nation survived. Even though there are many prophetic words that have been mentioned concerning our nation, but as long as sons of God would arise and pray, and we won't join the masses to condemn, we won't take sides, we are asked, on whose side are you on? So we won't be able to allow these other external things to defile our hearts. 
but we shall be the kind of people who genuinely pursue to know what is God's word concerning these times that are happening. When I received this word, I, there were two characters of people that came to my mind. One of them are people who have been heartbroken. People who are genuinely disappointed. Their hearts are in pain. And you see, when we allow the pains of yesterday, the pains that come from our families to rule us, we are not going to fully manifest that which the Lord desires of us. So we have to pray even for such kind of individuals who in their hearts they have pains, whom they might have been disappointed by their own family members. We have to make prayers unto these particular individuals. There are other people, the second category of persons, are they whom the Lord has genuinely been knocking at the door of your heart. You walk into any place and it's a reminder for you to come steadfast unto the Lord. And so, as the Lord knocks the door of your heart, it is your moment that you might open the doors of your heart unto him. That he shall come and the Father shall come. So there is those two categories of persons that we, I feel dearly that you have to pray for. People who have been heartbroken, tormented, and these people who have suffered weakness, even from the, the people that they love. More often than not, we suffer even from people that we least expect of our own family members. And with this, it is easy for us to wallow deep into our pains. But only if we can be able to rend our hearts unto the Lord today and allow Him to try our hearts that despite of the pains that have been, we shall not allow these pains to master our hearts. But today, even we shall pray for our nation, that for they, like myself, who get heartbroken every time you look at the news and you ask, now, what does tomorrow look like for us? If these are the kind of persons that we have, what does tomorrow look like for us? So we have to pray that the Lord would cover us. And by the Lord covering us, we'll be in a position where as the church of God, we'll actively pray for this nation. In our own secret places, we'll be able to lift up this nation. We know the heart of God concerning this nation. So if you fall within those category of persons, I invite you to rise that we might be able to pray together. If you feel that you are genuinely, you have been heartbroken, there is pain in your heart, we'll pray for you. And today who have suffered even wickedness from close people, their family members, and even for they whom you feel like the Lord has been actively calling you, calling you, knocking the doors of your heart. You walk into any random place and you hear a word that is so timely for you. The Lord is beckoning you to come unto him so that you can be able to pray. Power and sons of God arise and pray. It is the Lord who mends our hearts. It is the Lord who is able to give us peace. Jesus says that, and I shall give you peace, not as the world gives, because the kind of peace that the world gives is temporary. But Jesus spoke of a peace that is perfect. That when you're walking in guarding our hearts, this peace of God shall be able to guard our hearts. Jehovah is seeking for such kind of individuals who shall cry unto the Lord that, Lord, try my heart. I am angry, and that is for sure, but try my heart today. I have been hurt before, but try my heart today, O oh Lord, that he might heal our hearts.
Dear Lord, everlasting Father, the one who reigns on high, the one who says that we all I stand at the door of your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens his heart, then I shall come and the Father shall come and we shall dine with him. Lord, we invite you that Jehovah, as we are standing, oh God, you know the pains that in our hearts, oh God. The scriptures remind us Holy God, that you alone test the heart of a man. Lord, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that he who has suffered heart upon his heart, O oh God, that Lord, you heal them, O oh Father, of every pain that they have suffered, Jehovah. In Jesus' mighty name, O oh God, we commit them, Holy Father, unto your able hands, O oh God, that, Lord, you stretch your hands upon their lives, O oh Father, that you stretch your hands upon them, O oh God, that, King of glory, you shall strengthen them, O oh God, you shall give them thy peace, O oh God, thy peace that is able to guard our hearts, O oh God. You have told us and reminded us, O oh God, that out of our hearts, O oh God, the mouth speaks, O oh God, we have been in situations, oh God, when we have been angry, oh God. We have spoken words that have even hurt other people, oh God. But I pray, my Father in God, that this afternoon, Jehovah, would you heal our hearts, oh God. Would you cleanse our hearts, Jehovah, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, oh God. That King of glory, out of the conflict that we use, the words that we use, Holy Father, I pray, my Lord, may this be a mechanism, Holy Father, that you might use to search our hearts, that you might use to heal our hearts, Holy God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, O God, the scriptures remind us that blessed are they that are pure heart. Jesus, we pray, my Lord and God, that you purify our hearts this afternoon. You purify our hearts, Holy God, in the mighty name of Jesus. You are building a church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But in such a generation, in such a time as this, Holy God, I pray, Jehovah, that you would help us guard our hearts, my Father. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, oh God, we invite you, Holy Spirit, you hoovered, who hoovered, even across the deep waters and created that which was not to be. Would you give our hearts peace? Would you give our hearts joy? Would you give our hearts the joy of the Lord that we shall declare that the joy of the Lord today has become our strength? And today who are weak, today may they receive strength from you, my God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, oh God. Abba, Father, you are the source of life. You are the source of strength, Holy God. You are the source of all that we require, of all that we need of Holy God. We pray in Jesus' mighty name, oh God, that, Father, your hand shall be upon us, oh God. Your hand shall be perpetually upon us, Holy Father, that you shall lead us, O oh God, unto the path that you ought to be in, Holy God. And we commit our nation, Holy Father. We raise our nation before you, my God, that in this time, Holy Father, I pray, would you raise men and women across this nation, O oh God, men and women who shall pray upon this nation, my Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Holy God. That Lord Jehovah God, the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous person, availeth much, holy God. We pray and we want to see upon this nation, my Father, that goodness and mercy, O oh God, shall be in our midst, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, according to the word of Third John chapter 1, verse 2, that I pray that he may prosper in all things. May we prosper as a nation, my God. May we prosper, my God. May we prosper, Jehovah. We seek for you, my Father. We seek for your presence. Rain upon us, holy God. Rain your fire upon us, O God, that you might purify us, holy God, that you might find men that you'll be able to use, holy God, as the heart we have seen, O God, that is the basis of 
divine approval, my God. Father, may we not be a people who shall sing here and one day to be found not to be a people who can come into your kingdom, only God. We pray that you purify our hearts, only God. Purify our hearts, only God. Purify our minds, Jehovah God. Let your essence touch each and every of us, my Father. El Shaddai, my God. Let your essence touch each and every of us, my God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, only God. We bless you and we worship you. We bless you, my Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you remind us that with the ask we shall receive. So we ask for you, God. Thank you, Spirit of the living God.